You are uh, one of the most prolific uh, songwriters in the rock scene, uh, uh, both on past and present. Uh, where do you find the inspiration, but uh, especially the time, as uh, you are busy touring the world for many months of the year? Um, well, I find places that I visit can be very inspiring. I and mean, for instance, we were in Zimbabwe a few weeks ago, and I saw the magnificent Victoria Falls. And um, it's absolutely stunning. And, and ever since then, I've been trying to play something on nylon guitar um, that sounds or that describes what, what I saw. So I've been doing this fast arpeggiating thing and sometimes fast staccato runs to try and create the impression of water and water falling in particular. Um, I remember years ago seeing um, a famous guitar piece, Concerto de Aranguez, being played. And um, towards the end of the piece, just before the orchestra kick in in a big way, there's a moment that sounds like a thousand fountains rising and um, that was a huge inspiration for me, the idea that guitar could sound like that. It sounded a little bit like the harp, um, but it sounded like it was limitless in terms of the crescendo effect of that. Um, so I'm trying to describe nature at times. And then I think with electric guitar, um, it's more of a, of a for me, a kind of delinquent instrument. Um, I think of my young self and my young days trying mm. to be a blues player and to play angrily and fast and all of that kind of stuff. But it's a very different kind of God in a way. By nature and how you transpose it on the, this on the electric guitar. Yes. Um, well, I think like the violin, or a little bit like a brass instrument. Certainly at times it can sound like the human voice. And I think guitarists are off, often looking for that, to imitate other sounds. So um, sometimes just by doing something on, 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 it can sound like uh, like a train or a roller coaster. So the electric guitar is a little bit of a, a little bit like the synthesizer in a way. You can make a lot of different sounds with it. Uh, so I don't know if you play guitar yourself. Do you, are you are you a guitarist? Synthesizer. You're, you're a keyboard man. Well, I'm a big fan of keyboard, of course, because I grew up listening and still do, listening to the work of Bach, listening to the Italian concerto for harpsichord is uh, spectacular and hugely difficult and complicated, but also, but there's a simplicity of intent, the exploration of harmony. Um, so that will all, it's, that, that music is timeless, I think. So I was lucky enough to work with a number of keyboard players who all had reverence for um, classical work. And I think that that's where progressive music took its inspiration from um, so many keyboard players. Uh, Keith Everson, who was a friend, um, uh, Rick Wakeman, also a friend, uh, Tony Banks, of course, we worked together and we all share the love of classical music um, where it's those explorations but I think a lot of keyboard players, I remember Tony saying he wanted to be able to do what guitarists could do, to bend a note. And this is before the era of the of the flywheel and, and all of that. So early synthesized stuff eventually, of course, um, uh, keyboard players were able to sound like guitarists and guitarists could sound like keyboard players, especially with the tapping technique.
that that's interesting because like I can hear basically many uh, classical music influences in the um, like in the most important progressive rock pieces. Uh, for example, many by yes, or uh, even like what comes to my mind is the um, keyboard part of what's gorilla in wind and buttering, which I love. And uh, I can hear a lot of classical music inspiration there as well. Yes, you hear it with Procol Harum as well, you know, who are a big influence on Genesis. Um, so uh, it informs it informs everything, all of that. Classical music is part of it, but then with Genesis, we were using lots of influences around about the time of Foxtrot when, when um, uh, John Lennon said he thought that we were true sons of the Beatles, you know. Um, we were one of the bands he was interested in at, at the time. And um, that era is interesting because you get with Foxtrot, which became a number one album in Italy, um, Watcher of the Skies, the first track, has the influence of science fiction and classical music um, and social comment and humour. Um, yeah. So... You could laugh with it and you could cry with it. You know, I think that was, I think, why Foxtrot has, has lasted. Um, because there are a number of stories that accompanied each each track. And the same thing with Selling England by the Pound, where I think of it as a golden moment for Genesis. Foxtrot and Selling England by the Pound. Um, I think these are the strongest albums, if you take them in total. I don't think there's any tracks that sound like they are, they're not, not weak or padding or um, uh, bubblegum. You know, it's music that's not really pop music. It's, it's, it's its own thing. It's part jazz, it's part classical, part pop, pop rock, um, part big band. Um, all of those influences that the band shared together. Yeah, and so uh, let's talk about your new album, Circus and Night Whale, which sure. is a concept album, a furtive solo album, and will be released on 16th of February. So you yes. recently declared that you finally said things that you wanted to say for a long time. Like, can you tell yes. us more about that? Yes. Uh, well, People of the Smoke, the, the opening track, is my attempt at trying to describe London in post-war recovery. Um, I grew up at a time which was heavily polluted, heavily populated. Um, there were lots of bomb sites. Um, London was being rebuilt. It, has, it had to um, overcome that the aftermath of the war where we occasionally played on the rubble rather than in playgrounds. But as London started to be rebuilt uh, and Europe started to recover, um, we grew up opposite the Battersea Power Station, which was made famous in rock and roll many years later by Pink Floyd with the Flying Pig, the Animals album. Yeah, um, <laughs> that, that was, yeah, for me as a kid, that was um, the view from my my bedroom window, and it was the largest building in Europe, and it provided light and heat and power for half of London. It was so powerful, and it was the biggest building in Europe at the time. Um, this was right outside my window. Of course, it was heavily polluted because you had four huge chimneys, smokestacks, that um, were all spewing stuff into the atmosphere. So as a kid, I grew up with lots of colds and coughs and chest complaints and all of this. So there was a price for growing up in the middle of the smoke, which was the nickname for London. London was referred to as the smoke. It was a nickname that started, I think, in the 1800s in the Industrial Revolution, and it stuck. So everyone referred to London as the smoke. Um, 
People of the Smoke is about the people of London, 1950. So I, I used excerpts from radio from 1950, the year I was born, uh, just to set the scene of the kind of world that I was born into and the way things looked and sounded. Um, there's a baby's cry, there's a steam engine, there's uh, a string orchestra, and then there's a rock band. All of those things happen uh, just after all of the pronouncements on the, the snippets of the BBC to make it sound deliberately old fashioned so that one could get a sense of how far things had traveled since 1950. That sounds not so much like it's 70 years ago. I mean, in my mind, it sounds almost like it's, it could be 200 years ago because of the huge change in, in technology and the way ecology is, per, is perceived as, as a going concern. Um, the changes in the world have been, uh, have been great in the extreme Techno technological advances. Unfortunately, the world is now at a point where it's ready to blow itself up again. Um, and the British are now talking about getting an army and having conscription again which is the kind of stuff that um, would have been unthinkable after it had been um, disposed of in the 1960s because it was too expensive and kids didn't want to do that anymore. That's, that was the world of then, and I want to try and avoid a future that involves all that now. So, yeah, speaking of uh, People of the Smoke, um, you sing these songs in the uh, first person also, wherever you are. And yes. the song you think is the need of singing them in first person is because they are autobiographical songs, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. But there's also the idea of a third person, a traveler, in order to make the album personal, because I think I'm not the same person that I I was when I was originally born. I mean, if in, in a way, I'm a kind of a camera of <clears throat> impressions. But I think life has changed me a tremendous amount over the course of time and um, the, the chance to share those experiences, of course, uh, both in book form as an autobiography, but also with this sort of audio version with songs that describe events and big changes in my own life, both professional and personal. Which of the track best uh, reprints is uh, the uh, musician we are today? Well, because it's pan-genre, many different styles. Um, if I was talking about the guitar playing that I was most proud of, um, if it's rock playing, then I suppose the stuff that's... Let me see. Uh, get me out a very bluesy style of playing, but with a kind of grotesque circus dance of death aspect to it. So it's, if it's blues, it's a kind of dark blues. But then there's classical playing right at the end of the album uh, with White Dove. And they are very different aspects of what the guitar is capable of doing. So I don't think there's any one track that says it all. Um, it, it has to be assimilated ideally by listening to the whole thing. This summer, you did a very special tour uh, in, in South, uh, South America with genetics. Uh, how did uh, this uh, collaboration come about? Will you tour together again in the near future? Um, they Gen uh, genetics, they lost their lead singer at one point. He died in a skiing accident, very, very sadly. And in order to help them, I agreed to play a show with them. And um, I, I can't remember if the first show we did was in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, 
or if it was in Lima in Peru. But we've done both of those places. And I came back to, to do a tour with them. Um, they are not my regular band, but you know we did the whole of Seconds Out with them. And that was very interesting. So uh, there might be more shows with them. Meanwhile, I'm touring other places with my with my own band, and um, they're both very good bands. I'm, I've been playing with three bands recently, my mm. own band, plus Genetics, plus Jabe, who are Hungarian, and it's improvised, and it's fusion work. Um, so uh, the stuff with Jabe is more, is more jazzy in a way. And now uh, I want to, to ask something about Inca Terra, which is a dreamy piece that was forced the listener to the enchanted landscapes of the Inca Empire, the ancient empire. But those right. beautiful lines, yeah, have many, in many cases, in contrast, in contrast like with degradation and uh, poverty. So since you have been always sensitive to social issues, on your tour, have you had contact with such troubled population? And if so, can you briefly describe your experience and your feelings? Well, ever since I worked in Brazil, for instance, um, I used to travel to Brazil um, very regularly at one time. Um, and I had many friends there. I recorded there in the early 1980s. And I had guys on the album who lived in very poor conditions in the favelas, uh, the shanty towns. Um, but what I found was that um, sometimes those percussionists would only own one drum and those people would try and get as many sounds as they could out of one drum. I'm sure they would have dreamed of having a rock drum kit, but um, um, they do say that adversity, you know, is the mother of invention. And for those people, they would learn to get every single sound imaginable out of one drum. And so my own way of, of getting my head around um, uh, the inequalities of, of um, economic circumstance was to work with those people and to pay them in, uh, in their local currency, of course. Now, the only other things that I've been involved with in terms of, um, uh, I, I came up with an idea of rock against repatriation um, for the Vietnamese boat people, because I was concerned about Vietnam having been um, ecologically ruined by, by the, the Vietnamese war, defoliated um, many things. So I, I organized that with as many people in the music business as I could muster. For over a year, I, I was working on that. Um, there have been other things, but um, I agree with you that you know social issues are very, are very, very important. Uh, we in the West, of course, are very privileged, and um, I, I like to think that in the future there will be more social comment with things that that I do. And of course, I've worked with musicians all over the world, whether they've been rich or poor or whatever they they have. But also, I worked with Peter Gabriel when we had a, a, a reformation of Genesis, uh, when, um, the, um, when um, uh, the Nomad Festival lost a lot of money and then Peter Gabriel wanted to try and make up the shortfall and Genesis came together to, to do that, to try and help the African musicians in the main that had lost money. So, um, um, I, I flew 3,000 miles to be part of that. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware of that and very aware of my position of really, privilege. Really yeah. Yes. And now, uh, going a bit at uh, our home, like there is uh, Under a Mediterranean Sky, which is a complete yes. album, and it's second after 1978's tribute. Um, it was born where you had to interrupt your uh, North American tour because of COVID uh, and finding yourself at home without electric guitars. Uh, so what were the suggestions 
that lets you write those wonderful pieces and uh, especially something about La Casa del Fauno and Pompeii, where we are waiting yes. for honorary citizenship and we hope to organize that for the autumn when you will come here for the Italian tour. Right, thank you. Um, um, I, well, for a start, I love Italy and I love Pompeii and everything that it represents and the tragedy of the end of Pompeii. Um, in a way, it's 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 there as an example of the extraordinary things from the ancient world that Italy has been in the forefront of preserving not just its history, but its spirit of all of those things that make make your country magnificent. So um, most of the rest of the world has sold off its heritage. You know, you won't find the ancient Roman buildings or the Etruscan things, all of that. Um, um, it's, it's a rather extraordinary thing. It was my wife who suggested that my wife, Jo, suggested that we did something based on all the countries of the Mediterranean um, to choose a country that was a, a, a piece of music which would be typically Italian or typically um, uh, um, Romanesque or you know, to use a piece of Scarlatti, for instance, um, and try and describe Spain with Spanish-sounding track or France with a French-sounding track. So it was really... It was her idea and it gave me a focus. So in a way, um, that was a there was a sort of silent narrative that was driving all of that. Um, in the same way that there is a narrative that drives the current album, uh, The Circus and the Night Whale, it was something again that was suggested uh, by my wife, who is a very, very creative person as a writer, and uh, when she was a young musician um, from a very musical family herself, um, um, and, and as a writer herself and filmmaker. So we've combined forces. And many times I've done things that she has suggested. Once she sows the seed with me, um, Normally I have to go away for about six months and, 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 and think about how am I going to do a track like Natalia, for instance, a Russian based track until I got the idea of I could do it in, with Russian style orchestration, something that sounded like Prokofiev meets Tchaikovsky meets Stravinsky. And then once you get all of that, um, something starts to happen. But the cinematic quality of the ideas that she comes up with often drives um, the orchestral close, the way the way things are arranged, all of that. Yeah, that's, and uh, uh, it's always good. I think when you write songs with other people, I find myself comfortable even in writing songs with other people as well. Yes, it's it's good. I think to have a musical conversation um, often when there's an aim in mind and you haven't necessarily got all of the pieces of the jigsaw but somebody suggests something and there's, it's a, it's a great challenge um, being commissioned by someone else. And other times you commission yourself and you, you think to yourself, well, I'd like to do something that's jazzy that, that maybe brings New Orleans to life um, and, and various places. So I, I work on these ideas. They're all a bit like storyboarding for a film where you draw these pictures and then you try and describe them in a way. Your next live project is uh, based on uh, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, a complex album uh, centered on a story um, conceived and uh, written by Peter Gabriel. What will be your uh, approach in uh, performing the pieces? Right. Well, um, the thing about, about that is that uh, we as Genesis wrote the music and Pete also wrote the music, but he wanted to do all of the lyrics himself, which became a story. So it's a shared creative team, which is why it's, it's um, 
uh, credited to, to Genesis as a band, the, the, the five people we were at the time. Um, uh, when I celebrate that album, I'm going to do some tracks from it. I'm not doing the whole thing. I don't want to be um, always doing things that are archival. I want to do old favorites, but I want to do the best of. So I do what I consider to be the best of The Lamb and um, the best of other things as well, including the current stuff. So it's important for me to do solo as well as as well as Genesis. I I I think it's it's right for me to do that in the way that, you know, Paul McCartney for years didn't touch any Beatle material and then he started to do it and, and it became very interesting celebrating the whole of his career. You know, everything from Live and Let Die to Eleanor Rigby. Great. You know, then you get the best of the best of the bands and and uh, and everything else. They wanted to ask something about like my favorite Steve Sibaket song, which is Shadow of the Iophant. Oh, yes. And uh, yeah, uh, so we got two wonderful interpreters throughout the years of this song, where Sally Oldfield and uh, the beginning, and now Amanda Lehman, were giving a great contribute to this wonderful song, uh, even if it's completely different. Like, so what do you think is the, like, the, contribu the different contribution they gave well, I think that um, uh, at the time, uh, Sally Oldfield was very young and she had a very high voice. So I wrote it in a key that was suitable for her. Um, but then um, when I wanted to do it with Amanda, um, we thought it would be better to take it down one tone. So it's a little bit lower. Um, and then, of course, the effect of everybody playing that tune um over time we had you know drumming that you know celebrated it but also um it gave a chance for drummers to do something quite spectacular on the on the end so you had a whole drum solo going on that's like a storm at the same time as you've got the the um the bass pedals and the power chords shaking the foundations and keyboards going flat out and the effect of crescendo starting from glockenspiel i originally played glockenspiel on on the original and of course on record you can't get that wide dynamic to that degree it has to be seen live but it's become you know one of the favorites of of live work because it is influenced by classical music, but it's also got the aspect of, of, of rock drumming. Uh, it's a hybrid of um, a kind of pan genre hybrid of different styles um, over time. Um, there's the orchestral influence. There's um, um, there's also the idea of the link with ancient Greece as well, so that it sounds almost like a Greek tragedy, the way it, the way it progresses. Um, there was something that Joe, my wife, saw, and it was the Oristia, um, a very important a classical Greek piece. And she said, you know, listening to this piece of music, the crescendo at the end, she said, it reminds me very much of the Oristia. And, and even playing it to my grandmother, who wasn't given to um, artistic descriptions of things, she said, it sounds like a procession. It sounds like the Pope. Um, it sounds like the, the Pope in some tarot cards yes. is interpreted as both the Pope of the Hierophant, and they are seen as, as, as the same thing. But one is pagan, of course, and the other is 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 Catholic. 